welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit macrohive.com. So greetings, Shannon. It's great to have you on the podcast show. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. Now, I did really want to talk about your, your book on globalization. But before we do that, I like to always ask my guests something about their origin stories. So what did you study at university? Was it inevitable you'd end up in the sort of macro slash policy world that you've ended up in? I think when you're 20 years old, nothing is inevitable. But uh, so I studied at Yale University and I studied uh, politics and actually Latin America studies. I was really interested in in global issues and international issues. Um, and so when I left university, I worked briefly in New York and then really wanted to go live abroad. So I found a job with an investment bank uh, that moved me to Mexico City. And I got there right before the peso crisis happened and, and lots of changes happening in the politics there in that country. Uh, so worked for the investment bank there and then throughout Latin America for uh, a few years before I decided to head back to school. Um, I went and did my PhD uh, up at Harvard and during that time lived again in Mexico as well as in Argentina. Looking what was at your PhD on? Uh, it was on uh, the um, privatization of pensions in Latin America and the creation okay. of new uh, private accounts and financial markets um, around uh, pension, around pensions and and the money there. You know, all all dissertations are you know an inch wide and a mile deep, so it's you know a bit wonky, but. <laughs> Um, but looked at the economic and political effects of those shifts. Then after uh, finishing my PhD, I was at Columbia University for a year teaching and then joined the Council on Foreign Relations, which is a policy shop. Uh, it's a think tank that that uh, focuses on all kinds of uh, foreign policy with the United States. And we also publish Foreign Affairs, which is a well-known journal uh, and have been with CFR now for 15 years. Great. No, that's excellent. And you've recently published uh, this new book, The Globalization Myth, Why Regions Matter. And that's how I uh, discovered your your work, you know, and, uh, you know, apologies for not uh, coming across your work earlier, but it's, it's a really provocative book. And I, you know, I wanted us to delve into this. So obviously, you use the term globalization. So maybe we can start with some definitions here. So when people say globalization, what, what do they generally mean by globalization? People mean a lot of things by this. And that's one of the challenges we have. Mm. But but overall, in the, the way I was looking at it, and, and I think many look at it is the internationalization of trade, of money flows, of information, uh, the movement of people, uh, the movement of ideas and culture. So, you know, the Hollywood movies or the Bollywood movies that that crossed, uh, crossed the Pacific or the Atlantic, as the case may be. So it's really this movement of ideas that the world is much more connected. And I think probably the, the most concrete example um, or catchphrase of, of globalization is um, uh, the book by Tom Friedman, which is The World is Flat. And so this idea that everything just moves seamlessly around the world now in ways that it hasn't before. So I think that's what we sort of, at least, you know, in the media or others, we 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 conceptualize globalization as today. And, and there's been this general narrative that we've had a, a long phase of globalization that you could almost say started after the Second World War, and it was increasing rapidly. And then after the global financial crisis, we've had this sort of steady reversal of that deglobalization. So is that a fair characterization or, or, or not? So my take on it, which I explore in the book, is a little bit different than that. And, you know, we have this idea that the world is flat and, and sure the financial crisis set it back. But as I go into much of the economic data over the last 40, 50 years and, and, and some of these other, you know, qualitative studies of things, things have not become as global as we often think. And so that's the title of the book, The Globalization Myth, is that it's not actually what's happened over the last 40 years. I mean, what defines this last internationalization. We have seen internationalization. So, you know, for instance, between 1980 and today, trade has grown from $2 trillion a year to $22 trillion a year. So we've seen a huge movement of, of trade around the world. Uh, we have also seen money flows increase, you know, five, tenfold. Uh, the crisis, as you say, 2008, 2009, set that back significantly. But we've seen a huge expansion of money around the world. We've seen the movement of people. We see ideas and, and you know, royalties and patents. Lots of stuff is moving around the world. But I would say two things are, are different than we usually think. One is when we look at countries that truly globalized or opened up their economy over these last 40 years, 
Um, there's only been about two dozen countries that have really transformed their economy with with opening up. So in here, I'm, I'm measuring it as trade as a percentage of GDP doubled or more. That's not that many countries. We've seen dozens more, almost 90 countries that have seen trade as a percentage of their economy stagnate, or even there's a good number of countries that saw trade as part of their economy decrease over the last 40 years. So they've actually deglobalized, if you want to call it that, over the last 40 years, starting 1982 today. Um, and so one thing here is in you know, globalization, it's not as pervasive or, or as much of a juggernaut as we all think. Um, the second part that I found looking into the economic data is that more often than not, um, we, you know, we tend to think of globalization where you know, companies go to the other side of the world to source products or to find their customers. And you know, we have great examples of that. Companies like Boeing sources from 58 different countries and, and other countries, you know, other Coca-Cola sold in every corner of the world. We have these sort of ideas, but alongside those big high profile companies that go all around the world are thousands, probably tens of thousands of companies that yes, they did go international, but when they did, they went much closer to home. And, and what we've seen actually is that when most companies go abroad or money goes abroad, more often than not, it's more likely to go close by. It's more likely to go within the region. Uh, so, and you know, one just data point to kind of drive this home is the average good that's traded travels 3,000 miles, um, so about 5,000 kilometers. You know, that is the distance roughly between New York and Los Angeles. That does not get you to Shanghai or Guangzhou or other places like that. So sure, things do go globally in, in some cases, but as those statistics show, more often than not, it stays much closer than we think. And what that has led to is really three big regions. So you have a smaller number of country that are countries that are open, opening up and really participating in the global economy um, than we often think. And when they do, they're much more likely to go regional than to go global. And so what you've gotten over these last 40 years is the rise of three big regions, a European one, an Asian one, uh, and a North American one. And, and as I talk about in the book, uh, both Asia and Europe, for different reasons, have integrated or regionalized much more than North America has. And that to me, has brought them a commercial advantage. Uh, and, you know, the United States and North America, where, you know, where I'm based in, in New York City, um, has been somewhat to their detriment on the economic, global economic scene. And, you know, the first one you mentioned was a, as a smaller group that, that has globalized, and you said it was only a dozen or so. So what are some of the, the bigger countries within that group that have... Sh seen this big increase in the share of trade as a share of GDP? Sure, it's two dozen actually that happened. Oh, two dozen, so the, sorry. The, yeah. yeah, the main the main participants are a group of Asian countries. So this is South Korea and Taiwan and China and Thailand and some of the, you know, the, the Asian countries that have grown. Uh, Mexico is a country that has participated in this. Uh, much of Eastern Europe is is in here. So Poland and Hungary and Romania and others are, are big participants. Um, there are some small countries in there, the UAE, because of of energy and and things like that. But but really, the bulk of this, you know, 24, 25 countries are are those that have um, have also seen their per capita incomes grow significantly. So you know, a group of Asian countries, a group of of Eastern European countries, and then and then a couple in in the Western Hemisphere, particularly in Mexico. And where, where does the which group does the U.S. fall in out of the three groups that you mentioned? So the U.S. has not quite uh, doubled its its trade to GDP. I mean, the U.S. is traditionally and still is a quite closed economy. Um, so it's growing from a low base. Um, so it has increased, but it is not one of these uh, much faster growers. And and even uh, and a couple of the other countries that have seen their trade as GDP double have been countries that are in, were incredibly closed and then opened up a bit. But they're still some of the most closed countries um, around the world. But, but I think the real drivers here are countries that, that did embrace globalization, some Asian ones, some Eastern European ones, and they're like, and we have seen the parts of their economy, their economy sometimes as a whole or parts of their economy that were tied to this international trade, really being the engines for growth and prosperity in these places. Mm. And and before we go go into the you know the evolution of the regional blocks, um, is there something special about the U.S.-China trade relation? Because that seems to take up a lot of bandwidth in terms of the way people think about globalization. In some ways, it's it's a story of U.S. and China trade. You know, you, you know, U.S. buys Chinese goods, Chinese buy U.S. treasuries. There's, there's all this symbiotic relationship, which now obviously is coming under stress. But is there something special about U.S. and China? Their, their trade with each other? You know, I'd say what's interesting, and then obviously they're huge trading partners of each other, and particularly uh, China coming to the United States. Um, and it's been a big uh, political, uh, political, you know, tension that I think will continue throughout the rest of this decade. But what's interesting here, and I think sometimes misunderstood is, you know, the economic competition with China, leaving aside some of the high tech issues and the like, but just the general trade back and forth. 
the competition with U.S. workers and U.S. manufacturers, it's not just with China, it's actually with Asia. Um, and yes, mm-hmm. China is the often last uh, port um, where things leave because they were the assemblers, particularly in the 90s, 2000s. They've cha- been changing a bit over the last five, 10 years, but but they were bringing in parts from all other parts of Asia. And it's factory Asia. It's the fact that Asia is producing things together that made them so competitive vis-a-vis U.S. manufacturers and, and really gave, you know, many U.S. manufacturers a, you know, a run for their money or, or really eroded their, their ability to, to compete in U.S. markets and, and then in global markets. So I'd say what I do think with China is that challenge sometimes China um, provides, you know, there's some great economic papers um, by people like Gordon Hansen and David Autour called the China shock. And, you know, one, almost 2 million jobs perhaps disappeared because of, of China's imports to the United States. But I think you should take those and look more broadly. It's really Asian production chains, Asian supply chains that were so competitive vis-a-vis the industries that had been based here in the U.S. that that were eroded during that first decade of the 2000s. Okay, and you know, I suppose then that begs the question: then um, how did we get these regional blocks? So, in the case of Asia, what was the mechanism for this uh, regional block of of intra-Asia trade to build up? So, Asia's integration really started from the bottom up and started from companies and and CEOs. Um, so, this is really a private sector driven path that was followed. It was supported by governments uh, and particularly overseas development assistance and the like, but it started with the Japanese in the in the 60s. They ran out of labor quickly as they were, you know, f- a big Cold War boom um, as they were helping supply the U.S. military who was fighting in the Korean War and, and, and putting a, you know, a footprint in Asia. And so they started outsourcing parts of their production um, to, at the time, incredibly poor countries like South Korea and Taiwan and, and Singapore and, and Hong Kong, putting factories out there and then and then doing some of the, you know, the sort of beginnings of these global supply chains, these international supply chains were were started there or were one one path was there. Um, and, and then the Japanese government would follow and assist. So for instance, overseas development assistance from the Japanese government built the first uh, sort of international port in South Korea. So it faced Japan so they could get their exports back out, you know, a lot of their industrial companies. Um, and you saw this sort of J- Japan seeding other countries uh, around the region um, as they looked for labor and, and they outsourced. And then other countries, as they grew in, in prosperity and wealth, um, began to do the same. So then South Korea and Taiwan, as they climbed the value added scale, they began doing the same in Thailand and Malaysia and later in, in China. Uh, you know, one of the first biggest investors in in China uh, when it began to open up was were Taiwanese companies, you know, companies now like Foxconn and others. They were the first to really go in. Uh, you know, some of uh, South Korea's biggest conglomerates went into China even before South Korea and China had recognized each other as countries. So you see this, this sort of movement and outsourcing companies leading into the rest of Asia and creating these supply chains that work together that made them incredibly competitive on global markets. And then how does Ch- uh, China fit into that equation? Because presumably they were both a producer and a consumer, sort of both both sides. They have become consumers, especially recently. We see a huge boom, obviously, in, in Chinese consumption, as well as, as the rest of Asia, real you know growth in, in per capita incomes and, and consumption. You see China today doing very much what Japan did before, South Korea and Taiwan did before, in that they are now investing in their neighbors. Uh, and so foreign direct investment out of China in to the rest of Asia um, has grown. In fact, there's some uh, years in the in the last five, 10 years where uh, outbound foreign investment from China outpaces inbound foreign investment into China. So you see them doing the same thing, putting investments in, in lots of countries in Asia, both their private companies doing it, um, and then also their government uh, along their private companies through the Belt and Road Initiative, building you know ports and rails and roads and other things in to facilitate the business side as well. So I do think this is a model that has perpetuated itself across Asia over the last 40, 50 years um, and brought real economic strength to that region. And has there has it led to friction between countries within Asia? There are definitely moments. I mean, these is what's fascinating in Asia to me is some of this, you know, when Japan went into South Korea, you know, they had just been an occupying force just a few decades before. <laughs> so there are frictions there. We are, you know, notorious frictions between you know, China and Vietnam over, uh, you know, particular lines in the sea and, and who owns what. So this is not a region free of, of frictions between countries. It's very heterogeneous in terms of, of populations and languages and, and, and the like. But they have found through trade uh, and through investment 
uh, oh, an, an economic force, I would say. And there is a binding force that at some points offsets these tensions. Now, these tensions don't disappear. And, you know, we've seen them flare up just in the last you know few years, for instance, between South Korea and Japan and, and questions, you know, so the legacies of, of, of the wars before and, and what happened to, you know, comfort women and others and, and, you know, reparations that should have been paid. And sometimes this spills over into the economic sphere. You've seen uh, Japan hold back particular critical minerals for for South Korean, uh, you know, uh, high tech manufacturing and the like. So there are moments when this when this appears and 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 are challenges. But what I do find fascinating and I think is also quite telling about Asia is, despite significant differences and and difficult histories sometimes and and tensions. They have pushed forward on on these issues, and much of it has been led by the private sector. Now, in the '90s and 2000s, free trade agreements did come in, um, but much of this groundwork had already been set and and solidified. So it was recognizing a lot of these ties rather than being the the instigator. Um, that said, I do see Asia moving forward even today as we look at the world fragmenting for lots of reasons and U.S. China tensions and other things. I do see um, many Asian countries pulling together, whether it's free trade agreements like RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is one of uh, 14 countries that, that have come together, um, you know, other elements where they are they are integrating each other more. They're sort of doubling down on ways to work together to build regional supply chains. And, you know, just for instance, that particular agreement, I think one of the biggest factors it does is it changes, uh, you know, rules of origin, which are, you know, each free trade agreement has these um, sort of who gets tariff free and who gets to, you know, you have to produce things within a certain number of countries to get the sort of tariff free benefits or other kind of regulatory benefits. And what that agreement does is wrap up all of them. So all the countries that are under that big umbrella sort of get the same treatment, which overall what that means is it allows or encourages regional supply chains to deepen because there's a benefit to being within that larger club that that wasn't there before. And what country we don't often hear about in terms of global supply chains or regional supply chains is India. Um, it's it, it's a large economy. It's a bit more closed, more service orientated. But d- does India play a role within all of this? You know, India is one of those countries and South Asia in general is one of the areas of the world that were really left on the margins of this regionalization. They, for lots of reasons, historical reasons and their own, you know, their own cultural reasons and the fact that they're such a big country kind of like the United States. I mean, they're bigger than the United States in terms of population and the like. They didn't need to necessarily go out and look around the world. And they many and they have opened up, but um, but much less than other places. And one thing you've not seen is regionalization in South Asia. And and I would argue that some of the challenges um, in this sort of commercial side um, have resulted from that. I think a lot the regions of the world who uh, which did not regionalize, that did not integrate uh, had the challenge of being left on the end of global supply chain. So that meant they either sent out raw materials that that went to other places, and then they brought back the finished goods. Um, and so what that meant is you didn't get to participate much in that kind of meaty center of, of international supply chains that brings technology transfers, that brings you know increasing expertise, managerial know-how, really allows you to become more sophisticated in the kinds of production that you do um, and climb that value added chain and sort of increase your socioeconomic, uh, you know, incomes and and the like. And that's something where, you know, I see India and South Asia have that challenge, Africa, Latin America, these are all places that were really left on the margins for lots of reasons. But I think a big one is that they did not regionalize, they did not turn to their neighbors and get the economies of scale and specialization and larger markets and access um, that you get from combining together as a region. And this is something Danny Roderick has written a lot about, uh, about you know the, the path to growth or to get richer is you have to go through some kind of industrialization phase. And it seems like some countries have just skipped that whole phase. Um, what, what do you think of his thesis around, around that? No, I think that's right. And, and particularly, he talks a lot about premature deindustrialization. Yeah. So countries that lose their manufacturing sector before they get out of the middle income levels right, yeah, in terms of yeah. per capita incomes and get, they get stuck in this middle income trap. And I would say that lack of regionalization, the lack of turning to your neighbors and creating a big enough market and, and also having these economies of scale, um, particularly for countries in Latin America and Africa who've been hit hardest by premature deindustrialization, that this is a big factor why that has happened, right? They did not turn to their neighbors. So they did not have sort of this benefits that you see in Asia, that countries like, you know, Thailand or Malaysia or, or earlier on South Korea and, and, and Taiwan 
um, benefited from. And, you know, we, we forget this, but you look back in the early, the 1960s and, you know, many countries in, in South America were richer than Taiwan and South Korea and the like, and that is not the case today, right? Um, while those countries really took off and, and fundamentally transformed their economies and, and, and diversified them, um, you know, lots of countries in, in South America, as well as Africa and, and even India, which is, which, it, which has changed somewhat, but, but has, I think has been slower. I think this is this is one of the big factors. Hmm. And and just if if I recall my uh, academic days, you know, there's the gravity model in trade, you know, which states that uh, trade is related in some way to distance of your trade partners and and the size of the economy. So the gravity model. But then there's the other theory, which I'm not sure what the right name is, convergence or new growth theory or or something like that, where you know the argument is that it's it's about uh, low industrialization to high industrialization. So it doesn't really have distance as as a factor within there. Um, what 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 are your thoughts on some of these theories around trade? Well, I do think the distance theory, in some ways, has paid off, um, yeah. or has 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 shown to be to be robust, um, though probably for different reasons than when it was initially initially put forth. Right? We have seen over the last 40, 50 years, and this is, I think, in part why we talk so much about globalization. We've seen a huge decline in the frictions. Um, that usually come with distance. So, you know, containerization and the like means that it's just not that expensive to ship things around the world as the way it used to be. And the, and the costs have just plummeted. Um, you know, the ICT revolution and, you know, communications and technology means you and I can talk here across, you know, across uh, oceans and it doesn't cost either of us anything, right? Because, um, or maybe it costs us a Zoom uh, subscription, but other than that, everything is, is pretty easy. So you can imagine, and, and people obviously do this, um, being able to manage pretty complex manufacturing processes or services or other businesses across huge, huge expanses. Um, and so that is, you know, why the thesis, the world is flat, seems to make sense. Um, but distance has remained stubbornly robust. And in fact, um, McKinsey did this study where they studied, you know, hundreds of companies and, and they even came up with a term for it and they, they call it the globalization penalty. And so they find that companies that go abroad increase their profit margins um, but the further abroad you go, your profit margins then tend to go down again. Um, and so there's something about distance um, that is costly for the bottom line. And, and I think, you know, when people do more qualitative studies, they find it's because, you know, the further away you go, time zones still matter. You know, we, we've all been on Zooms with places on the other side of the world, and it's sort of hard to pay attention at 9 p.m. at night on your, your time frame. Um, you find that cultural differences really do matter. Um, it's it's hard to translate what people actually mean or the way they like to be managed and the like. Um, often legal systems are different. So you have to have a whole new accounting departments. And I mean, there are different reasons why this happens, but but that distance still really does matter. So I think that's held up, though perhaps for different reasons than those initial economists thought. Yeah. And and in terms of uh, culture, I, I wonder, is it distance or is it culture that matters? So for example, you know, if, if there's Anglo culture, so Australia and the UK and Canada and Nor North America, I mean, would they, although they're quite far apart from each other, would would trade be quite high between them, you know, uh, notwithstanding the distance that they have? I mean, I think there are elements where where you do see that. You do see see trade across, um, and some of those things are, are less expensive, but there still seems to be a challenge to distance. And especially if you're moving physical products, even if containerization has brought down the price, it still costs money, right? And it also still costs money in time as well and moving things. And, you know, when I was doing research for the book, one of the most interesting um cases I found um, was the case of Zara. So Zara is an international fast fashion brand um, based in, you know, grew out of Spain and the like. And it is both the biggest fast fashion brand in the world. They sell half a trillion dollars worth of goods every year. Um, so bigger than any other one. And it is the most profitable of all fast fashion brands out there. Um, and the way they do this is they produce almost everything that they make in Europe, not in Asia. They don't make, they make very little, some basic t-shirts in, in, you know, Bangladesh and China, other places, but really it's all Asian based. And there's ways European that they do based. this. You're sorry. Yes. European yeah. based. Um, yeah. So they do this by, you know, there's a lot of automation in the way that they do things. Um, they do things in much smaller batches. So they don't make, you know, huge runs. They, they you know, uh, curate and, and cultivate, um, you know, for, for consumers. And they get things to market much faster than if you make it in Asia. So they don't put it on boats that take, you know, six weeks or, or two months to get across one of, one of the oceans. Um, and by doing that, they don't have to discount 
as much as others. And so their profit mm -hmm. margins are quite high. And so what this tells me is sure, you know, you could imagine European and, and, you know, Australian and, and New Zealand or what have you, that there's, there's other similarities, but, but the distance really does matter for um, production and for, for profitability. Yeah. And actually, if you look at Australian trade numbers, it's mainly with Asia anyway. It's not really with uh, with the UK, say. Um, now, we mentioned and Europe. Asia's, I would say uh, Australia's uh, been trying to move away from China in, yeah. in terms of because they've had some challenges with China and they're finding it very difficult. And I think partly because of this almost centripetal force that you yeah. get uh, in terms of trade. Now, we, we, we did mention Europe. So what's been the European model of regionalization? So Europe's model of regionalization really came out of World War II, and, and many countries were desperate to avoid another war. <laughs> and so they first turned to trade, and they were trying to recover after their economies had just been devastated by, by the war itself. And so you saw the initial agreements in, in you know just a few years after the war based on coal and, and steel and others. And then you saw diplomats you know, going from city to city over, over the next 40 years and whether it's the Treaty of Rome or the Treaty of Nice or the Treaty of Lisbon or the Treaty of Maastricht or you name it, there's many, many treaties where diplomats came together and formed first a European economic community um, that took down tariffs. Uh, you know, later on, you saw them work on monetary policy together. You saw them form in the 1980s a single market, so taking down lots of the other regulatory barriers and the like. Uh, you saw them join their passports, so you have one passport around the European Union, and then you saw most countries or many of the countries in Europe join in a single currency um, in the you know in the late 2000s. And so many, this was all very driven by diplomats. Now, obviously, businesses were involved and 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 supportive and and benefited from this and were at the table often in the discussions, but. But Europe is interesting because it's a very top-down system and has created institutions to manage all of this. So, you know, it's the, you know, in Brussels now, there's the everywhere you walk, there's there's another building for, you know, whether it's a court or a legislature or a parliament or or an investment bank or all sorts of things um, that really help manage this overall relationship. And it has led to one of the most integrated and regionalized uh, entities out there. And Europeans really make things together and then they sell things to each other. So anywhere between you know, 60 and 70% of, of trade and money and movement of people and the like really remains within the European Union today. And and then, um, you know, we have a country that's tried to de-regionalize within Europe, the UK, with Brexit. I mean, what are your thoughts around that? I mean, in some ways, that almost seems the exception that proves the rule. You've seen what's happened to the UK in the, in the last few years since it uh, left the European Union. Um, it has had huge costs in terms of its trade with the union, it's it's had disruptions uh, in terms of of its economy in many ways. I mean, there's lots of factors out there. It's not it's not the easiest time in the global economy, but um, but you know even the you know official UK reports and like show that there's a huge loss in growth, loss in dynamism um, that the UK is suffering today and will continue to suffer because it's decoupled uh, or pulled itself back from the European Union and. Um, one thing we have seen, if you look at, at uh, UK trade, um, it continues to be with the European Union. It's just you don't get the preferable rates or or the ease of, of um, ease of back and forth that you had when you were part of the club. Um, so you pay more. You're less competitive today than you were uh, before within that that big market of you know 450 million people and the like. So um, this seems like a you know since we're in the middle of the World Cup right now, it seems like an own goal that uh, Brexit <laughs> has has. <laughs> done to itself or that the UK has done to itself. And, um, you know, I, I won't, uh, I won't even begin to pretend that I understand UK politics, but the fact that you've run through so many uh, prime ministers in the, in the last uh, number of months, I think has something to do with how untenable um, the economic situation, at least a little bit, along with many other things. Yeah. Um, but the challenges of Brexit for the UK to find a prosperous path forward. Yeah. And I think the UK actually, in some ways, is, is a good test of your thesis, because if regions didn't matter, then the UK could quite easily, you know, uh, attach itself to some other you know, large trading, you know, other trade, trading nations, but instead, it's finding that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's hard, you know, it's trying to have relationships with Japan or India, or even the US, and it's, uh, it's not as easy as it thinks. It's not as easy as it thinks. And, and, you know, it just made it more expensive for it to trade with the people that it, you know, it used to trade with, or the or the economies and, and find the consumers that it used to it used to service. Yeah. And then how about North America? So we've talked about two cases, 
kind of positive cases, you, you could say, of regionalization, you know, the bottom-up approach in Asia, top-down approach in Europe. W- where does North America come into this? So North America chose sort of the Goldilocks middle between these two in that it was driven by a commercial agreement by NAFTA, which now has transformed itself into the USMCA, another uh, free trade agreement. Um, but it, it's sort of not the nice Goldilocks middle that we often think about in that in that story, right? It, it turned out not enough of one and not enough of the other. So we have seen since NAFTA was signed almost you know 30 years ago, um, we have seen particular industries benefit and thrive from it. Um, the automobile or the you know vehicle industry, aerospace has been one, some processed foods as well. But you haven't seen the breadth and depth um, that you saw in Asia in terms of so many different industries. You haven't seen electronics as as significant or other sorts of you know textiles and the like. Um, and I think that has led to a real loss in in North America, where you've seen many of those industries just depart wholesale for Asia or or other parts of the world, um, precisely because of that. Um, and you have not seen on the other side. You have not seen any institutions at the time of, of NAFTA, you know, all three countries, but I think particularly the United States were allergic to setting up any kinds of, you know, supranational institutions that would, you know, affect any kind of sovereignty as, as many of the countries talked about. They're a bit prickly about that. Um, and there's a lot, and there's a loss there too, because you did not have, for instance, investment in one country and the other to strengthen the infrastructure between the countries to allow for logistics to become cheaper and the like. You ha- did not allow for, you know, many, NAFTA got rid of tariffs, but there's still, you know, hundreds of regulations that that affect trade between the three countries and just make it a bit more expensive um, for goods to move back and forth. And, you know, an example of this, which is, you know, I guess my favorite example in, in how odd it seems to me is that Cheerios, which is, you know, a, a cereal made here in the United States that lots of kids eat um, uh, every morning. Um, if they're made in Canada, they can't can't be exported to the United States because we have too many regulations. Okay. Um, and that seems a bit odd to me. So, and you have so many more of those. Um, and those frictions you don't see in Europe. That's something actually that the agreements that diplomats negotiated, where in Europe, unless there is some way you can prove that there's some sort of harm or national interest, goods uh, flow freely and don't have that kind of regulation. Is one reason why it's it's worked less well in North America because there's less countries in North America. You, you mentioned three countries, you know, US, Canada, Mexico, whereas Europe has like 20 to 30, depending, uh, you know, and Asia has a huge amount of countries. So there's there's a, a big diversification benefits and so on. So is, is one of the reasons why it hasn't necessarily worked as well in North America is the too small a set of countries. So they almost needed to include South America as well. I mean, that could be one reason. One would think it'd be easier to negotiate between three countries than 27 countries <laughs> in terms of everybody's yeah. needs. But maybe, maybe you know, the fact that there's so many countries you come to, to come to a baseline. You know, I think part of it is the U.S. Um, sees itself as a singular place. Um, if you listen to our political speeches, you'll, you'll hear that. Um, I, I think uh, also the U.S. Um, took a while to, you know, I think the lesson that the U.S. took away from the 1950s and 60s when it really was the economic powerhouse in the world and the manufacturing at the at the apex of 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 much of this, um, in part because it had no competition from the rest of the world. Right. Europe had been devastated by the war. Japan, too, was just getting back on its feet. The rest of Asia it was still quite poor. And. And it it sort of um, became a bit complacent uh, in its in its ability to lead, and and so it wasn't quite ready to realize that it needed um, that it needed partners, um, that it needed to expand. And I would argue, and and do actually in the book, and you know the 1980s was a really difficult time in in industrial uh, industrial U.S. And you know I start off the book. I grew up in Akron, Ohio, which was at one point the you know rubber capital of the world, or that's what they like to call themselves. But they were producing half of the tires that were made in the world all over, and They lost that industry. And the last tire that was made in Akron came off the assembly line in 1982. Um, And many hold this that city up and many like it as, you know, this is exactly what globalization does. It's a victim of globalization. But I would argue it was actually uh, the result of limited regionalization. So they were making tires, but they were competing against the Japanese who um, had good technology, but were outsourcing and creating things all over Asia already by the 70s and 80s. Uh, Europe too. You had, you know, Michelin from France and Continental from Germany. They were serving, seeing the whole European community, so they had this big market and were able to make things across countries. And places like Akron were left on their own. NAFTA was a decade away. 
Um, and so they weren't able to make high quality, but affordable tires or, or other kinds of products. And um, they lost out orders to, to the others. And all those companies were um, in the end sold off, bought up by the Japanese and, and the Europeans, um, many of them. And so what I see the, the US a bit slow to, to realize, but now is the time to realize is that you know, whether you like it or not, this last phase of globalization has been one, I would say, characterized by global supply chains. This is very different than previous waves of globalization, is that it's pieces and parts that are moving around the world. So today, 75% of what's sent across borders are what economists call intermediate goods, not, not final goods, but the, but the pieces and parts. And this has made companies that do this and countries that get involved in these supply chains it's made it incredibly profitable um, to do so. And so now manufacturing has become really a team sport. And if you're going to try to play alone, like the United States often tries to do, um, you're not going to succeed. Yeah. So it's, it's it's almost like this paradox. If you do want to compete against, say, the Asians, uh, the US, I'm saying, um, they can't do it alone. They actually need to form a, a tie up with Canada and Mexico mm -hmm. and other countries in its own hemisphere. Uh, its its own uh, side of the, of the world, and then it would have a better chance. But the, the the fear, the concern you hear, at least when you listen to American politicians, is that they'll lose all the, all, all the jobs will go to Mexicans or Mexico. So you know they still lose anyway. Yeah. So what we know though from the economic data is actually that's not the case. We know two things. We know. One, that all trade is not created equal for U.S.-based companies and U.S.-based workers. Some trade is better for them than not. And the other is that actually not all the jobs go to Mexico. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why, I would say. Um, the first is that when a factory opens up in Mexico, uh, it is much more likely to buy parts or suppliers or supplies from suppliers in the United States. And we see that in the trade data in that products that are imported from Mexico to the United States, on average, 40% of that product was actually made in the United States. So a huge percentage was came from US factories um, because you have these supply chains that have been created and that are robust. We also know that when products come in from China, less than 5% of that product was made in the United States. So barely anything because China's turning to Vietnam or or Thailand or, or name your other Asian country to buy their supplies. So it does matter what kind of trade for your own industrial base. The other thing uh, that you know the U.S. can take advantage of: the United States is has very little, frankly, um, preferred access to global markets. So it has signed free trade agreements with less than ten percent of the global GDP. Um, so it only has you know tariff-free access and lower barriers and, and regulations and the like with with less than ten percent of of the globe's GDP. Mexico and Canada, uh, in contrast, have signed free trade agreements with sixty percent of the globe's GDP. So if U.S. suppliers can supply factories or assembly in Mexico or Canada. They have preferred access to much more of the world's consumers and, and customers out there. And so they can actually increase the number of orders and, and sort of the overall pie that they have access to compared to as if they were shipping them just here from the United States directly. So I think we the political debates are, as you say, you worry that if you open up and trade with other countries, you're you're going to lose all of the jobs. But I think the reality is likely the opposite, that you're much more likely to create jobs in the United States if factories open up in those countries, because one, they're going to buy parts from you. And two, you're going to have access to the you know 7.5 billion other people who live around the world um, that you wouldn't have as, as, as good a chance with or you know be as competitive with in terms of providing if you try to go it your own. And um, that all, all, all makes a lot of sense. Uh, now, about South America, you, you obviously have a lot of experience in, in the region there. Why, why hasn't South America created its own trading block? You know, this is a really good question. Um, it has a lot to do with politics. Uh, it, you know, South Americans, uh, the Latin Americans and South Americans for many, many years have set up lots of bodies or it can be about integration, but they ended up all being, you know, photo op, basically. Um, they didn't get beyond the politics of it. Um, you saw in 70s, 80s, into the 90s, many countries turning inward, trying to protect their industries rather than thinking about combining with their neighbors. Um, they have not invested in infrastructure to make logistics costs come down. So it's really expensive to move things between countries. You know, just an example, there's only one railway crossing between Argentina and Chile. So if you're thinking about sending, you know, intermediate goods back and forth, it's going to be hard to do. It's going to be expensive. 
Um, same with ports. Um, you know, many of the global shipping companies, they come into South American ports and then they head out to other parts of the world rather than going to other other uh, countries, you know, along along uh, nearby other neighboring countries. Um, so there's a political dimension. There's just a logistical commercial expense dimension. Um, but this is one of the reasons why I think South America has been slow to grow, has been slow to climb the value added chain, to diversify their economies and are suffering from what we were talking about before, this premature deindustrialization. Many countries, Brazil in particular, but many countries in South America have lost their manufacturing industries um, before you know they were able to really scale up um, and become wealthier economies. So I think this is a, a challenge for the region. I, I do think right now with all of the geopolitics is happening, with you know automation, with climate change, with lots of factors that are hitting global supply chains that we saw really augmented with COVID-19, um, there's an opportunity for countries that didn't really participate in the last round of globalization or didn't benefit as much um, to jump back in there, to, to find a way to become part of this process that I think will continue. Um, but to do so, I do think regionalization will still be really important in order to have a big enough market, a big enough economic base, access and the like, um, to make it profitable. Um, so, you know, if you want to put a, a, let's say a rare earth uh, processing plant in Chile, it's a country of 20 million people. You really need access to larger markets um, in order to make it work. And, and then the same thing for other complementary industries. So there's an opportunity here, but but you really have to seize it. So the opportunity is also for the US as well. And COVID seems to have uh, brought this focus on to bringing supply chains closer to home. Do you think there is an appetite on the US side to rethink NAFTA and its regional trade policy? I think there are some initial steps here that, that need to be pushed further. And so we did see, the we saw during the Trump administration, a renegotiation of NAFTA into what's now the USMCA. And one thing that is different than the past 10 years is you saw a bipartisan group come together to pass that. So both Democrats and Republicans backed the new USMCA and, and cemented it into being. So I think that is a step forward. We have also seen in the under the Biden administration, we have seen and the Congress, uh, this last Congress, really focus on national security issues and parts of the economy that they felt need to be moved out of China. So whether that this is semiconductors, whether this is you know other critical minerals, um, whether this is electric vehicle batteries and and lots of green transition types of of technologies, there's a lot of federal money, you know, tens of billions of dollars going behind to to move these out of China or find other other suppliers. And and what I have noted. In, in many of these bills or, or now laws that have been passed in the United States and money that is being allocated is that while some of it is by American and, and is reshoring, um, the door has been open for Canada and Mexico, um, whether that's electric vehicle batteries and, and, and the parts that go into those, um, and even perhaps some of the semiconductor supply chain, because it's more than just creating the actual semiconductors in a fab, it's you know the packaging and testing or the, or the processing of the materials that go into it. And so I do think we're beginning to see a little bit of, of expansion. And, you know, those people who focus on resilience of supply chains will tell you that geographic concentration is not always your friend. Uh, if everything's made in the same place, you know, doesn't matter if it's in Wuhan or Wichita, uh, a natural disaster can take it all out. So um, so that too, the geographic dispersion is is important for the resilience factor if that's why you're trying to move your supply chains. And, and we haven't talked about energy so much within all of this. I mean, how does energy fit into this? Because there's certain nations that you know have the energy and it's you can't always regionalize. Um, so that's more of a global market, you could say. How, how do you think about energy? I mean, energy is a huge issue. Um, it's a huge issue in a couple of ways. As you say, right, some countries have have uh, energy, particularly traditional fossil fuels um, that that everyone needs. And, and that is... I don't argue in the book that there's been no globalization because, of course, there has. It's just that more often than not, uh, especially in the, in the manufacturing, it has been regional. Um, but energy also provides certain places an advantage over others. And as I look at the next 10, 20 years, I would say here North America has a huge advantage. Uh, we've seen that Europe has some energy challenges right now, particularly with the Russia-Ukraine war and trying to totally transform where it gets energy, what kind of energy it's using. Uh, Asia has much higher energy prices and doesn't have a lot of natural reserves and the like. And, and North America 
Canada, the United States, and Mexico have a lot of traditional fuels. Um, they also have a lot of access to uh, or potential for renewables, whether it's wind or solar and the like. And we do see the U.S. government putting a lot of money behind trying to control or benefit from the technologies for the next set of, of green technologies and the like. So so is China, so, is, so are countries in Asia, and so are Europe. So that, I think, is the next you know, tech race is going to be who will control some of these defining green technologies um, down the road. But as it stands, I would say of the three big regional blocks, uh, North America looks the best on on the energy side of things. And this too is an advantage that um, potentially the US and its neighbors could take take, you know, take full uh, take full advantage of. So there's an interesting there is an interesting path forward for the US then it has the energy resources. It also has uh, kind of catch up to play on the regionalization side, which is almost uh, not quite free, but you know, it, it gives you there's some confidence that you you could sort of have some benefits there um i mean how optimistic are you about this all unfolding i think the economic basis is particularly positive for the united states the fact that we are seeing supply chains a fluidity to supply chains that we haven't seen for 20 or 30 years because of, of lots of reasons that are out there geopolitics being one of them um i think this all provides an opportunity mm. what does worry me is the politics of it um, and the politics in the United States, as you rightly pointed mm-hmm. out, um, often leans protectionists. Um, so really understanding that if you want to benefit U.S. workers, if you want to benefit U.S. based companies and have more here, opening up is going to give you more access and more opportunity than than closing down. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, Mexico today um, and under its leadership is also turning inward, has become quite nationalist, mm. whether in terms of energy, in terms of industry and the like. And so um, it's not just the United States that can get hesitant to come uh, to come to a more regional uh, approach to things in Mexico today, at least under its current leadership, is, is also one that is questioning um, this path forward. Now, we've, we've covered a lot of ground and, uh, you know, your book is, is you know, covers a lot more. Is, is there anything you, you think we missed in terms of uh, important points? You know, I think what I would say is that, you know, I look at this history of the last 40, 50 years, but I also look ahead and and, and how this is going to go forward. And I would say, you know, whether it's the geopolitics and the U.S.-China dis- distancing themselves, if not decoupling, whether it is just the transformations in technology, you know, we're seeing automation hit all kinds of industries and AI and quantum computing, Um, whether it is climate change, where you see both the effects of climate change and natural disasters on on logistics, and you see governments stepping in um, because they have pledges to meet. They want to become carbon neutral by by certain dates and the like. And so every extra mile that things are, that are transported, that increases emissions. And so that will be costly for companies. Companies too are jumping in here and making pledges to their shareholders and like. All of these factors, I would say, um, are leading to supply chains to pull back a bit. And I would say though, leading them to be more regional because what companies are finding, except in a very few areas that governments are willing to subsidize indefinitely, um, is that international supply chains are just too profitable um, to get rid of. because you know, and you need to compete against other people. If you don't have someone backing you, you need to make a profit every every quarter or the like. Um, and so those are going to stay. Um, but some of the other factors are going to drive more of this regionalism than not. Um, so as I look forward, this is a trend we've seen for the last 40, 50 years, but it's one that I think we're going to see for the next 10, 20 and beyond. Okay, that's great. So I'd like to ask all of my guests uh, some personal questions. One is, what's the best investment advice you've ever received? And the best investment advice I received is from uh, Peter Swenson, who um, has sadly passed away, but was at uh, Yale University and ran its endowment. And he um, was with a group of us and said that as an individual investor, you really can't beat the market. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, he said, of course, places like Yale's endowment, they can get into deals that other people can't see and, and they can beat the market. <laughs> um, but for the average person, that is very hard to do so. So um, find a low cost fund. That's what he said. Okay, that makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, the other um, question I'd like to ask again: uh, Our audience, uh, we have many young people in our audience, and many of them are leaving university now or school, as you might call it in, in America, to enter the jobs market. What 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 advice would you give to to younger people as they leave the academic setting to to the the work setting? I mean, I would say to, for young people out there is you're going to have a long career, and when you leave university, is try a lot of things, get out there and and try some jobs. I know here in the United States, people often fo- focus on returning very quickly to graduate school to go get a law degree or a business degree or a PhD or what have you, but 
give yourself two, four, six, however many years to try a few things before you go back to grad school um, and to a professional degree. So you really know what you want to be doing uh, once you get there. And some things might work out and you'll love it. And then, you know, you learn something too from trying a job path that um, maybe isn't the right fit. Um, another question, this time on productivity. Uh, I assume you're inundated with uh, research and uh, information. I mean, how, how do you manage, you know, all, all of the information overload that we all suffer? This is the hardest one, of course. Um, I guess I start my day, I read a couple newsletters that at least do the first summary of things for me. So one is a uh, um, a, a email list called News Items by John Ellis. He used to work at the Wall Street Journal, and I find a great summary of the news um, that that's out there. Another one I've started is uh, Semaphore, which is a new um, a, a new list that started with folks that used to be at Bloomberg, and I find those a really good summary of the general things. And then, of course, we have all have our deep dives into particular particular you know rabbit holes and the like of, of things that we follow. But but it is a big challenge today, I have to say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then on on, on books, um, are there any books that really influence you over your career or even outside of, of uh, work, uh, just books that, that, you, that you're really drawn to? You know, I think in terms of books, um, as a, you know, as a writer, it's, it's uh, I always appreciate people who are beautiful writers, because I think one of our challenges and back to the information overload that you you just mentioned is how do you communicate well um, and, and how do you get ideas across? And so, you know, some of the, the books that have really influenced me have nothing to do with the policy sphere. And I just see them as beautiful writers and, and expressing ideas. Um, you know, one of my favorite books still is a book called Blindness by Jose Saramago, which just tells this beautiful story and, and, and about humanity uh, and the like. Um, but back a little bit closer to, to the mm -hmm. policy work and things I do, I have amazing respect for some of my colleagues at the Council on Foreign Relations who take very complex ideas and histories and and boil them down and make it, you know, dare I say, almost, you know, can't put them down stories. And so, you know, a recent one that I really liked is um, Sebastian Malaby. He is one of my one of my colleagues, and he wrote a, a book called The Power Law, which I think is a great depiction of the history of, of venture capital and, and the rise of Silicon Valley. Um, he has some other great books as well. Um, I'd also highlight uh, Max Boot is another one of my uh, one of my colleagues, and he writes amazing histories about the military and the like. Um, one of the one of the most recent is called called The Road Not Taken, which tells a, a, about a moment in, in U.S. history. And these are really interesting topics and times, but I think it's how they communicate these ideas in ways that anybody can understand that um, I aspire to do as well. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a joy to read really good writing and I write a lot as well. And it's, it's hard to write well. I mean, it's surprisingly hard. I mean, what, what, really what tips would you give people to write better? I mean, how do you become a better writer? You know, I think the, um, I don't, it's always attributed to Mark Twain, but maybe to other people's as well is that, you know, if I'd had more time, this letter would have been shorter. Um, and, and I think that that's it is you, you sometimes need to put stuff on the page and then calling it down and, and making it shorter um, and, and much more straightforward. The other thing I do, which I think, you know, people in my family think I'm a, a, a bit off of my rocker sometimes is I read it out loud. Um, and, and does it sound like something you could actually talk about rather than, you know, very long sentences and all of a sudden all those subjunctive clauses, they don't yeah. roll off the tongue very easily. Yeah. We, we have a editor in our team, a chap called Matthew, Matt, Matt Tibble. And uh, he just told me one of his secrets. He's a great writer. And he, he turns all of our research notes into something much nicer. And he told me he gets the uh, computer to read it. Mm. Uh, and so then when he listens to it, he realizes there's some errors there as well. So, yeah. so uh, the same process, I guess. Same I'm process, it to yeah, <laughs> but he's kind of automating with the text to speech is much better now. So, um, so yeah, so, so I agree with that as well. Um, now, finally, I mean, how, how can people follow you? I mean, obviously, I'd, I'll, I'll include a link to the book, which I urge everyone to read. It's a very thoughtful and provocative book at the same time as well. So, so that there's a book to read. Um, how else can, can people follow you? Well, I would say as of today, you can follow me on Twitter, which I still use. We'll see if that okay. lasts. Uh, and that's <laughs> Shannon K. O'Neill on Twitter. Um, but you can also find me on LinkedIn, um, which maybe is maybe is the place that, you know, some of us will migrate to. It's, it's still Yeah, there, yeah. But... Let's see if it Twitter turns into that hellscape or not. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then you can check out, you know, I have a bio page and information at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, with, with lots of the work that I've done. Okay, no, that's great. Well, with that, thanks a lot. It's been really, really thoughtful and engaging conversation with you. Um, and good luck with, uh, with the book and everything else. 
Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a great conversation. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.